but uh, <laughs> the equipment you're using is far cry from what we used before in the, 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 the partner uh, series. Yeah. <laughs> I was impressed with the video quality on those, though. Is that right? Very good. Yeah. When were they done? Gosh, 10 years ago, I suppose. Yeah, roughly 10 years ago. Yeah, and it was just done by students, right? So it yeah. wasn't like any super yeah. professional level, but it looks good. Like the lighting and the sound is really clear. Oh, good. So good. I assume it was standard definition is probably its only mm -hmm. yeah. potential downfall for... You know, down the road, use right. PBS or anything like that. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's nice for those people that aren't around anymore that we have. Oh, oh my, sorry. yes. Oh, sure, yeah. Quite a few. We're not there anymore. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, this is up and uh, up and going. And going. I'll just start the other one while we go. And okay, you're all good. Great. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, I'll start by just having you say and spell your name. Okay, William Bear, B A I R. Great. And my name is Robert Bauman, and today is August 14th of 2013. Uh, and we're conducting this interview on the campus of Washington State University Tri Cities. Uh, so I thought maybe we could start by having you first tell us uh, what brought you to Hanford, how and when you arrived here. Okay, well, actually, it's kind of ironic because uh, the uh, I wouldn't be here or anywhere if it were not for the atomic bomb and the plutonium that was produced here at Hanford. <clears throat> I was in the infantry during World War II in Czechoslovakia, and when the war was over in Europe, <clears throat> we were shipped to the Pacific. <clears throat> we had been trained for amphibious warfare, and when problems got tough over in Europe, they shipped us from <clears throat> to, to Europe instead. So we were prepared and trained for Pacific warfare. and. Um, we got down to the Pacific, of course, the bombs had been dropped, and instead of going into uh, Japan as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, what, invasion army, we went in as an army, army of occupation. And uh, a few things I remember about that, and I think I should tell people, <coughs> that is when we got down to the Pacific, uh, uh, as far as I could see, there were ships. The ocean was just covered with ships prepared for the, for the invasion. Unbelievable. And then uh, when we got into Japan, <coughs> we had an opportunity to, to see what they had prepared for us. Uh, the division I was in was responsible for destroying a lot of the munitions, particularly naval munitions that had been stored and ready for the uh, invasion. And uh, a friend and I were sent up in the mountains in Japan. We took over a, a warehouse that was just full of, of rifles and all kinds of, of small arms. So the Japanese were really prepared for for us, and uh, I, I think people should know that that if we had an invasion, if we had to go into an invasion, it would have been a terrible loss of life on both sides. The Japanese people would have suffered immensely, and certainly the invasion forces would have suffered. So if anybody wants to argue the point where the bombs should have been dropped, I'm happy to take them on. Okay, how I got here <laughs> um, after. Uh, we got out of the service. I went um, to Ohio Western University, got a degree in, in chemistry, and uh, happened to walk by uh, the bulletin board when I was a senior, and they were a notice for uh, uh, fellowships in radiological physics. And uh, I uh, really didn't know anything about radiological physics. Uh, I'd applied for graduate school at Ohio State University and, and was accepted there. But I thought, well, I'll just check this out. So I had to take an exam and pass it, and it was um, notified that I had gotten a, a scholarship or a fellowship at the University of Rochester Medical School. But <clears throat> what the training really was was health physics. It was the first uh, uh, fellowship classes uh, being uh, funded by the Atomic Energy Commission at that time for uh, training in health physics. So I took uh, that f the first year and um, had some summer training at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And uh, one of the professors, uh, Newell Standard by name, um, asked me if I'd want to stay on as, as a graduate student. And sure, why not? <laughs> I still had some B GI Bill time left, and uh, so I decided to to, uh, to use it. And uh, so I was there uh, working on a PhD until 1954, and uh, then looking for a job. Well, one of my uh, uh, 
uh, lab mates that uh, had worked here, Hoyt Whipple. He worked for, for uh, Parker and had left there and gone back to Rochester. Turns out his, uh, his father was dean of the medical school at Rochester, so I suppose he had an interest in going back there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I checked around. I had an offer to Oak Ridge, another at Yale, and uh, one out here. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, it wasn't always positive, the comments I got about it here. Um, but uh, they offered more money. And, and my wife was pregnant at that time, <laughs> so that made a big difference. And so that's how I got out here. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, that, I want to ask a little more about the, the program at Rochester. Uh, so this was a fairly new, a new program? And yes, I was in the second class. Okay. Um, and so you, were you one of the first doctoral students there? Or? Well, I was, <clears throat> the uh, radiation biology was, was told to do. In fact, when I started that program, they did not have it authorized. And uh, I was in the uh, physiology department at the medical school with that for a couple of years until they got it authorized. And I did receive the first PhD in radiation biology there, and I think in the world. Uh, Dr. Standard always claimed that I was the first one in the world, so I won't argue with him. So. <laughs> Uh, so you said you arrived uh, Hanford in 1954. Yeah, September 54. And what were your first impressions of the area? Well, it was kind of interesting. Uh, first, uh, having come from uh, Rochester, New York, and lived in Ohio before that, I was amazed to see the big river here with no trees along the shore. <laughs> I think that was my first impression. It seemed impossible. Um, certainly, it was obviously it was a country a company a town, and. Uh, uh, that didn't bother, bother me. Um, the uh, uh, it, it was unattractive. If, it, if nothing was was really negative about about it, I can remember anyway. I think that the most uh, uh, negative comment I took back to Barbara was the fact that the, the lack of trees. Um, her father uh, actually was uh, supportive of my coming here because. Uh, he had, he had been a comptroller at the General Motors plant in, in Rochester, New York, so he was a company man. Mm -hmm. So when he found out that General Electric was operating this plant, plant why, you know, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. So, he approved. Right, he approved. So, um, so you mentioned uh, Richland was a company town uh, sort of place. Uh, what was the housing situation at the time? Were you able to find housing right away? Or? Well, no, all the housing was controlled there. The, there were two types of housing, uh, one certainly owned by the government, built by the government. Then there was another, uh, I think maybe two developments, one called Richmond Village. Uh, do you know where Richmond Village is located? Okay. Uh, that had just been built, and it was built, I think, by a private uh, company, but uh, I think uh, underwrite by the government some way. And so we, we took one of those. Um, in fact, we didn't. Have a, have a chance at one of the government houses. But after a year there, we did have an opportunity to, uh, to move into a bee house in South, South Richland. And uh, we lived there until they were, they, those houses were sold. Uh, I can't remember what year that was. But, uh, and we actually bought the bee house and converted into a, a single unit because we had, by that time, um, uh, well, two boys and another one on the way, I think. So we needed more room. <laughs> Do you remember how much you paid for that bee house? Uh, I don't, but not very much. Four or five thousand dollars, maybe. I don't know. I think we sold it for fifteen, so we made a little money on it. <laughs> yeah. um, so, when you came to Hanford, then what what sort of work were you doing? Where were you working? What part of the area? Were you well, I was a, I was trained as a radiation biologist, and uh, so I was hired by Frank Hungate. Um, to uh, work with him in uh, uh, cellular level studies. Actually, we're trying to understand the mechanism for radiation of causing health effects. Mm -hmm. And so it was really pretty basic research. It was uh, uh, genetics, mutagenesis kind of studies I was doing. The, um, the theory that uh, we were looking into was uh, whether uh, uh, a real isotope incorporated in genetic material when it de decayed, it would become another element. And in that process, whether it would actually cause a mutation. Um, we had uh, no really positive, but we had some very suggestive <laughs> results. But uh, it didn't uh, certainly um, uh, 
make a big impact on the uh, on the field. And then um, after I was there two years, uh, I, Barb and I agreed that we would stay at least two years. And we felt that was had to, that, you know, you make a commitment, it's got to have some. We weren't about to jump ship right away just because of the dust storms. <laughs> um, I did uh, have an offer from the University of Illinois back in Champaign, and uh, I would be setting up a new program there on the, on the campus. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever one I look at it, Barbman went back for a new interview in August. Have you ever been to Illinois in August? I lived in Illinois for a couple of years, so yes. Okay. <laughs> Humid, uh, hay fever season, Barb and I were a mess. <laughs> And so we, we came back, and uh, I did receive an offer from him. And, uh, but about that time, um, the person who was leading uh, the inhalation toxicology program at, uh, out here at the site um, died. And so they, they were replacing him. And since I had been at the University of Rochester, where uh, much of the pioneering work had been done on inhalation of uranium and things like that, they assumed that I knew something about it, and they offered me the job to, to stay on and manage that program. Well, with the hay fever situation, <laughs> uh, it was a good job. I hated to turn it down away, but we did, and so we stayed. Do you remember the name of the person who ran the inhalation toxicology before? Well, uh, uh, Ralph Wager. Wager, he, he, Wager W-A-G-E-R. He was a physician. Um, uh, I had I had met him, but but he he didn't uh, live much longer after I got here. I, I think he's a very capable uh, person. Uh, so, how large was the inhalation toxicology program? How many people were involved in that? Huh. When I took it over, there was I three and a secretary, <laughs> uh, and I was the only PhD. The, the other two were were uh, one had a master's degree. I'm not sure the other one did, but it, and then I, I think that's all. So we started out scratch. These were good guys. Really, I couldn't have been better. I couldn't have asked for better people to to start out a program, even though they didn't have the degrees. Um, uh, Lou Temple was uh, uh, he said histology was very good. He would, he would qualify for a lot of pathology work. And Don Willard was a, uh, I think, he was probably a primary chemist, but he was a. You know the term Rube Goldberg? Mm -hmm. Okay, he was a Rube Goldberg. You you tell him what you wanted, he'd he'd make it happen. <laughs> he could do all kinds of things with nothing in the in the shop or the lab or whatever. And we were we were venting new territory. There were there was no technology, uh, no publications uh, showing us how to to um, develop the technology, to build the technology to expose animals to highly radioactive materials, which we had to do. And so he was largely responsible for putting all that stuff together. And um, Engineers would look at him and shake, his, shake their head, you know, the trained engineers, but they couldn't do it. He could. <laughs> so, but we had a lot of help from uh, other people on site. There were um, uh, other uh, aerosol physicists working in other programs. We, uh, they were able to help us. Um, the uh, one good thing about uh, the lab at that time was that they, they really believed in statistics, and they had uh, statisticians assigned to us. And I'd come from the uh, University of Rochester, where we, where they really did preach uh, the value of statistics and doing research. You talk to a statistician before you start your experiment. <laughs> you have them involved in designing your, your experiment, and uh, that way, uh, they are way, way ahead of the game when it comes to interpreting the results. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, uh, uh, that's how we got started. Uh, we uh, we were, had to certain advantage in a sense. We had at that time um, a program out there where we had uh, uh, military veterinarians coming in for training programs. So that gave us an opportunity to have an extra set of very qualified hands. And so we uh, had several vet veterinarians uh, working with us on the program. And uh, I think that, I uh, uh, can't remember the first one I hired, I think I hired the uh, I hired a physiologist, a, a Ph.D. physiologist. And then I, uh, I need a veterinarian because the, I think the military program was closing down. And um, I, uh, I had a friend at Ohio State University. Uh, um, he'd been a fraternity brother at Ohio Wesleyan. So I called him. He was in a vet school at Ohio, Ohio State. And I asked him uh, if he had any 
graduates who might be candidates for a job. Well, he had several, and so I went back to, to Columbus and to interview these guys. And um, uh, one, uh, Jim Park, uh, was, I thought, the best one. He didn't have the best grades, but he was just came across as being the person I wanted. But there was a little bit of problem, I thought, possible problem. He came to my hometown. And, you know, you hire somebody from your hometown, it doesn't work out. It's not, you know, the town, probably eight or 10,000 people. The word gets around. So anyway, I decided to take a chance. He decided to also take a chance. And, and it was probably one of the best decisions as manager I ever made because uh, he worked out very well. In fact, he, he worked on until he retired. In fact, he just died this last January. So. It's Jim Park? Jim Park, yeah. Um, so what was the hometown? Where was the hometown? Bell Fountain, Ohio. You know that area? I do not know where that yeah. is. I was born in Ohio, but I don't know where that is. Okay. It's, it's between Lyman and Dayton. Okay. It's right in a straight line. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so you said that uh, this group started out very small. How much did it grow during the time that you were in the employee? Well, um, during the time I managed that, which was probably about uh, until about 68, um, I know we must have had... Uh, I can't remember how many, 10, 15 people probably. Okay. Yeah. I had uh, uh, foreign scientists uh, visiting. I had one from Turkey, uh, another from Japan during that period. Uh, uh, that's, that's probably about right. And, uh, um, and so the inhalation uh, toxicology program, I guess, could you explain sort of what sorts of things uh, you're doing, experiments and studies or whatever? Sure. Um, well, it, tur it turns out uh, that uh, the m most uh, common, uh, most frequent um, uh, way people were being exposed on the plant, the workers being exposed on the plant to things like plutonium, particularly, uh, was by inhalation, uh, airborne plutonium in the processing plant and everybody else, uh, else they work with it. And um, so not much was known about plutonium, in fact, essentially nothing because it's a new element. And uh, there have been injection studies uh, uh, at uh, Berkeley, California, University of California, Berkeley, and other places where they took amounts and inj injected into experimental animals uh, in intravenously and uh, sometimes just through the skin. Um, these were not uh, really duplicating the kind of exposure that people were having because the people were breathing it. And uh, so we had to... Uh, to do some research to find out where it goes and what the effects might, might be. Uh, at that time, uh, we, uh, uh, as, as a we, uh, meaning the scientific community, uh, suspected that um, things like plutonium would cause lung cancer, but there was no experimental evidence and no, no human subjects that are, no human exposures that ever result in lung cancer. Uh, the main evidence we had for uh, radiation causing lung cancer occurred in the, in the Miners, particularly starting in uh, Germany and Czechoslovakia, the hard rock, mi hard rock miners were uh, developing lung cancer being way back at the turn of the, the century. And it wasn't until the 1920s they finally identified it was radon, that, that the radioactive radon gas that was causing uh, lung cancer in these, uh, these miners. Um, so, and then, of course, uh, with the uh, uh, development of the atomic energy program in the United States, there was a lot of uranium mining going on. And they were already, already beginning to see uh, evidence of increasing lung cancer in some of the miners down in, the, in the Utah and places like that. So th there was reason to be suspicious, but there was no experimental evidence that it would, would happen. And so our studies there actually uh, uh, with, with big old dogs uh, showed the, the, that actually you could inhale enough plutonium to, to cause lung cancer. And uh, I say enough because uh, we certainly show that uh, very small amounts uh, would not do it. You had to reach some, I can't, you want to use the word threshold, but we don't know whether that's the right, but some level amount before we'd see those kinds of effects occurring. Um, our first studies were, were with uh, mice uh, we actually put uh, radioactive material and injected into their trachea, and we had no effects there in, that, in those cases. Um, uh, 
We had, uh, as I said, we had uh, Air Force uh, military uh, veterinarians on site. One of them was Jack Healy, who was uh, then returned back to the Sandia base. And then Air Force was very interested in plutonium for obvious reasons, because they carried weapons around containing plutonium. And uh, so they uh, contracted us to do some studies on, on the early effects of people inhaling plutonium oxide, the weapons grade plutonium. And uh, they want us to use beagle dogs. Beagle dogs uh, were an ideal uh, uh, experimental animal. Uh, they had been used at Cornell University in studies there. there. There was a big study at Utah in which they were actually in, injecting plutonium and radium and thorium into beagle dogs. Uh, down in Davis, California, a veterinary school there, they had a, a large program using beagle dogs for external radiation and so beagle dogs were an ideal animal for research. Um, so we did, we did uh, sign the contract with uh, the Air Force to start the study with beagle, beagle dogs. And um, I think about it, about two or three years in the, in the study, we found the first lung cancer. And um, the, uh, the uh, lung cancer was, was rather unique because it was uh, rather occurred down really right deep in the lungs, right where, where the plutonium was located. A plutonium uh, is an alpha emitter. The radiation from plutonium only travels a, a, a few, uh, well, a few cell diameters. So it's uh, wherever that material is located, the tissue around that's going to be pretty heavily irradiated. So if you have too much there, you're going to kill the cells. But uh, if you don't have enough there, you, you're less than the chance of having a, the kind of a reaction that would result in the cancer occurring down the road. Um, we, we'd had other uh, findings. So we found that, um, that one of the early effects of uh, inhaling something like plutonium was a uh, decrease in the circulating lymphocytes. And uh, we couldn't, uh, well, I don't think we've ever have worked out the mechanism for that happening, but almost all these animals that uh, had a sufficient amount of plutonium would show an um, early decrease in the circulating lymphocytes. Now, <coughs> just stop here a second. Um, I mentioned Frank Hungate, who hired me. Um, he was working there, at the, sort of working at the time, and we had some discussions about that. and. Uh, that well, maybe uh, maybe this could be used in, in some uh, uh, helpful way. Uh, thought that uh, if you could use this in some way to knock down the lymphocytes, uh, then you knock down the immune system in that in uh, organ transplant people, or even treat the leukemia patients, it would be worth looking into. So Frank Hungate did uh, develop a uh, an implantable blood irradiator that uh, had radioisotopes in it and, and uh, that you could actually implant into a person and run the blood uh, vessel through it so you're reading on a continuous basis the circulating blood. He had that and, uh, implanted in dogs and, and <coughs> in goats. It had uh, uh, considerable interest uh, from the clinicians, but uh, not enough money was put up to, to take it much further than that, so it never got into clinical trials. Anyway, that's a spin-off from that, that kind of research. Um, another thing we found, too, is that the uh, plutonium was very, very insoluble. <clears throat> and uh, so it was just like a, you know insoluble metal. And it would accumulate when it was in, inhaled in the, in the, into the lungs. The um, clearance mechanisms would actually move that plutonium into the lymph nodes. There are a number of lymph nodes uh, throughout the lungs of man, but the most of them are effective ones are right around the bifurcation of the, of the bronchi. And we found that uh, the concentration of plutonium in the, uh, these lymph nodes uh, was, after a short time, was much higher than concentration in any of the tissues in the lungs. So this was a uh, mechanism to pr protect the individual because we never saw any primary lung cancer or primary cancers uh, originating in, in lymphatic tissue in, in any animals, and we had thousands of animals on experiment. So that was, that was a, a very interesting uh, finding. And when I'm on the subject of plutonium, um, uh, we also did some studies with plutonium-238, which is another isotope of plutonium. Uh, the 239 is uh, weapons, we're using the weapons, and uh, 
238 is a uh, shorter half-life uh, plutonium. The plutonium-239 has a half-life of about 24,000 years, so in a sense it's not very radioactive. But plutonium-238 has a half-life of something like 80 years. It's very reactive, uh, re radioactive. In fact, it's so radioactive that it's hot, thermally hot. And if we take a particle of it, and we did see this frequently, and have it in a plastic, like, uh, uh, plastic glass, it would actually melt down into that. So it's so, so hot. Um, we did experiments with, with some of those particles, and um, they essentially melt the tissue, but I don't think we ever saw any serious effects um, of, the, uh, of the material. But the interesting thing about plutonium-238 was when you had the same form, oxide form, insoluble form, uh, and animals inhaled it, it did not remain in the lungs or lymph nodes very long. More of it started to, to become soluble and move to the liver and other tissues, like the skeleton. Well, at that time, uh, this was in the early 60s, the uh, NASA and uh, the Air Force uh, were using a plutonium-238 as a heat source in uh, thermoelectric generators. Um, they use them in space vehicles. They, you know, they use solar panels for some of them, but this was a uh, source that could be totally contained in, in the uh, space vehicle. In fact, uh, a number of those out in space are, are powered with plutonium-238. But they had, a, when they first started their program, they had a, a failure to. Um, I think one of them was called a SNAP device. I don't remember what that stands, space nuclear something program. But um, it uh, burned up on reentry out in the Pacific, and the fuel at that time was pretty soluble, and it just spread all over the earth. Everybody inhaled it, you know, very, very small amounts. You know, it's like fallout from weapons testing. And um, when we uh, began to show them what the problem was that with plutonium-238 oxides, uh, they decided they better change their, their, their fuel source. And from there, they, they developed a, another one. Uh, it was actually a ceramic that was almost indestructible. It, could be, it would withstand uh, high temperature fires. So we did contribute, uh, our results did contribute to, uh, to the space program and to the use of uh, plutonium-238 as a heat source in these uh, uh, thermoelectric generators. Uh, I was going to ask you about, so how were these uh, inhalation experiments conducted in terms of the dogs? How, how were they, how did they inhale the, okay. I guess that's specific uh, to that. We had to, I said earlier, we had to develop all this technology. And the important uh, issue, well, several important issues. One, we had to do it without contaminating ourselves. And the second is we wanted to uh, be able to uh, to control the amount they inhaled, or at least to be able to measure it. And so we, uh, it, first thing it meant that we, in, in order to protect ourselves, we had to do within a glove box containment some, of some kind. So we had to work through gloves and all that kind of stuff. So then uh, first uh, we started working with, uh, with rodents. And uh, we started uh, mostly with uh, mice and then and, and rats. We took a cylinder and made a, got a plastic cylinder. We had good shops here at Hanford. They would uh, build a, a plastic cylinder, oh, probably that much in diameter, any height we wanted. And then we drill holes in the, all around. The uh, aerosol would be interministered at, at the top, and um, we had a continuous airflow through, through it, and the exhaust would go through several air, kinds of filters to make sure that none of it got out. Then uh, we found that uh, in order to contain the, the rats, for example, there was nothing better than the old-fashioned Coke bottle. You know what I'm talking about? The Coke, okay. Well, we, we cut the bottoms off the Coke bottles, and that expanded area just was ideal for the lungs area of the, of the rats. So they were, they could, they, we could put them in the rat, put, a, a, and they put the rat in the bottle, put a rubber stopper in the back, and they were totally comfortable and could breathe very easily, and then we just plug the uh, these bottles into the uh, into these holes in the in the chamber, and then of course we collected aerosol samples during all this time so we could actually get some idea of how much they were breathing. So, and we then we also collected samples that we could 
uh, characterized in terms of particle size. And that's one of the findings we did uh, uh, come up with, that we found that uh, the uh, particle size, the size of these particles, had a lot to do where the material deposited in the, in the lungs and how long they stayed there and so forth. So how did that work with the dogs then? And with the dogs. They, we, we taught the dogs to, to uh, sit with a mask on their face. And the, uh, the uh, mask then was uh, connected to the, to the chamber. And uh, they were, the dogs were in, a, uh, in their own little glove, glove box, actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> attached to the main glove box, which had the, the aerosol uh, chamber in. The dogs, uh, we, dogs are really lovely when you, to, treat, to train. You know, they'll, they, 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 they'll, well, you know, you train them to do anything if you want to. And we had so many veterinarians around. <laughs> and um, actually, the lifespan, the average lifespan of our dogs, even the ones on experiment, exceed far exceeded the average lifespan of dogs in the public sector because they had so much care. And uh, you know, they had. Uh, well, some of them had weekly physical exams. Uh, they had 24-7 uh, care. Uh, um, and so how long were you involved then with the American Toxicology running that program? Well, I, I think about in the night, it was about 1968 when uh, uh, Dr. Kornberg uh, uh, moved to another position. Dr. Kornberg had been hired by Herb Parker in 1947 to come here and take over the management of the biology program. This included the health and environmental sciences. And uh, in about 1968, uh, he, he uh, uh, took another position in the, in the laboratory. And at that time, by that time, uh, Battelle had come in and replaced uh, General Electric. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to replace Dr. Kornberg as manager of the biology department. And that's when my hands-on research kind of went down the tube. <laughs> uh, so uh, how large of a department was that then in 1968? Uh, I, I don't know. I would say, I think I have on my, my cheat sheet, sheet. OK? That's fine, sure. <laughs> Actually, let me think about that. Yes, 214 people, 200, over 200 people. Okay. And started out with size of the group I said here was two. And it grew to about 21 when they left the program. Okay. And so you said you weren't really doing research yourself then at that point? No, I, 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 uh, I was shuffling papers then. <laughs> But I, I, I still, I still write more papers, and, and I certainly was working with the scientists who were doing hands-on stuff, obviously. So. Yeah. And what, uh, so, what sorts of things were was the department doing in, in general? Um, the uh, when Patel uh, when Patel came in, uh, things changed quite a bit. Before that, um, almost all of our research was directed towards uh, Hanford production pro pro problems. Um, we we uh, I should mention a few if it's okay. Um, I think some of the most important work had to do with uh, uh, the uh, developing biokinetic models for the for the radionuclides. We had to develop uh, the, the protection was based on dose to the people and individuals, uh, individual or organs. Um, so they had to develop models to, to describe where the radio materials, radioactive materials would go when they went into the body. So a lot of work was done to develop these models. Uh, another big program was in studying the ingestion of, of radioactive materials like plutonium. Uh, it was necessary to know what percentage, what fraction of material that you ate and went through the GI tract would be absorbed. And it turns out that you can eat a lot of plutonium without having very much of it go into your body. Uh, I think I tried to duplicate with uh, some, some material once a big chunk of it would for you ever having any, any health effects resulting from it. Just so insoluble. Um, then uh, another uh, big uh, major program was developing um, uh, methods to, to treat people who might be contaminated. Um, 
we call it decorporation, uh, trying to remove the uh, the particular plutonium mattress in the in the, in the body's t tissues. Uh, it's there it's to stay, and you, you have to go to re, uh, extreme means sometimes to get to move out and excrete it. And that's what you want to do because you're reducing the dose in the process. Um, so uh, that's really started pretty early on, early 50s. Uh, and then uh, by John Ballou and several others, Morris Sullivan came on about the same time I did, and he kind of uh, latched on to the ingestion route of, uh, of intake, uh, studying uh, the absorption across the uh, gut wall and also effects of ingesting radioactive materials. Uh, that, that contributed a lot to the, the models used today. And you'll see his papers are referenced in, the, in the many of uh, the publications. Um, then the, the, uh, the other one was, uh, was uh, tr uh, to mention decorporation. Um, the uh, program was, was started uh, on, a, on a small scale before uh, I arrived, and uh, uh, another scientist, Vic Smith, uh, arrived uh, uh, shortly afterwards. He was from Montana. He was a chemist, and still here, uh, incidentally. Um, he uh, went on and started working on on that program, and uh, was very su successful. And, um, and it was it was very important. Uh, it really paid off uh, when uh, they had that accident out at the 200 areas when a man by McCluskey was exposed to big. Uh, you know, dose of, of amberesin. Uh, Vic Smith uh, synthesized the uh, the DTPA, the, the drug to treat this man. So it uh, it really was, uh, you know, couldn't have been more timely. We had a guy here who could, who could synthesize the drug and and tailor fit it to the treatment. So, and that is uh, actually today it is the uh, the um, the uh, recognized treatment for any. Uh, uh, intake, accidental intake of, uh, of many heavy elements like plutonium. So, and so you were, you directed the biology department uh, beginning nineteen sixty eight. Yeah, I think it was about that time. How long did you do that then? Um, let me use my cheat sheet there. I can't remember. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's about 1973, okay, 1973. Then um, uh, they changed the, uh, the uh, well, <coughs> department of, was actually, I can't remember if it was still the AEC then or not. I think it might have been. Um, they, re they wanted somebody <coughs> uh, whose full attention would be paid to their programs here. <coughs> so... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Maybe I should take a break and take a. Sure. You can edit this up. <laughs> <coughs> well, <coughs> they wanted uh, somebody. I said to um, have the full century, the full time responsibility, paying attention to their, their programs. And so Ed Alpin, who was the director at that time, convinced me that I should be the one to do that. And initially, uh, I uh, actually went back and worked half time at uh, at uh, Germantown headquarters. Uh, I, that was not a good time for for us. We had two two boys in in high school, and another one in junior high school. <laughs> it was a tough time for, for for Barbara, especially because I I would fly back to to Washington, work for two weeks, come back here week to weeks, come back here for two weeks, back and forth and back and forth, for gosh over half a year. Uh, and then finally, uh, I, I took the position. By that time, they had a replacement for me, in the, in the as manager of the, of the biology department. Because I was actually doing, I think, three jobs at that time, and uh, so then I, I was full time director of the. Of the Life science program, which included the uh, environmental programs, the atmospheric sciences, everything that they funded, and I did that for uh, for several years, and uh, for a long time actually. Well, the, 
the, the title changed and some of the other things changed with it, but uh, it did uh, essentially that same job until about 18, 1986 when um, they reorganized and the Life Sciences Center was formed and uh, I assumed responsibility for life sciences. And that included uh, uh, toxicology, health physics, uh, epidemiology, molecular biology, say toxicology, uh, some radiological physics. It was a broad-based health uh, medical program. Could uh, it could considerable medical research too? Uh, that must have been a fairly large group. Then. I think uh, I, I think I had some like five hundred people. Yeah. Um, and you did that till when? Till I did that until. Well, I was trying to retire, but Wiley wouldn't let me retire until he <laughs> got a replacement. And uh, so I think I did that until 94, I think it was, a okay. I should send, say something about Bill Wiley, and you know the name? Sure, yeah. Um, Bill Wiley was a, uh, was, a, was a biologist. He was a molecular biologist. And, um, and uh, I was manager of the biology department at, at the time. And uh, uh, the, his, his supervisor, his boss of that section, uh, was moved to uh, to Seattle to by up to the Battelle Center at Seattle. Uh, yeah, it was a doings of people back in Columbus. They needed somebody over there, so he went over there. So I need the replacement, and so I twisted Bill's Bill Riley's arm to take that job. He didn't want to do it, <laughs> and but I finally convinced him that was a thing to to do, and um, so I I really. Uh, uh, lost a, a good scientist, but I, I obviously uh, uh, the laboratory Hanford got a darn good uh, manager, and uh, it worked out worked out well. And I think he was uh, eventually. I think he resigned himself to it and was happy it went that way. Um, so I was going to ask you a few, few questions. Uh, at some point, Hanford right, shifted from focus on production to focus on cleanup. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering how that shift impacted the sorts of things you did or the people you, who were working with you at all. No, uh, I pretty much. Uh, uh, I don't think we. I don't remember much of that happening uh, um, until after I left. I know we. There was some uh, concern out at the uh, the uh, tank farm because. Uh, there were some uh, toxic uh, gases coming off, and uh, they were interested in, in uh, helping to try to identify them. But I, the, the cleanup hadn't really gotten okay. far. At least we were not involved in them. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. uh, I'll go back a little farther. Uh, President Kennedy visited Hanford in 1963. Say who? President Kennedy. Okay. Uh, I wondered if you had any memories of his visit at all, or you here? Um, no, I don't really. Uh, no, I don't remember much about that. Uh, okay. I can't remember. I remember his coming, but uh, I don't remember. I didn't. I didn't see him. <laughs> okay. Um, what was? Um, what do you think were the most challenging aspects of? The work you did at Hanford, and, and what was sort of the most rewarding parts of it? Well, probably the most challenging is is uh, it was not the not the science; it was the uh, what you had to put up as a manager. <laughs> uh, I uh, I think I was happier as a scientist than I was as a manager. Uh, uh, I probably ticked off a lot of the people who uh, who. Uh, were were providing support because I probably wasn't a lot. They probably didn't view me as the most cooperative in many ways, but um, it was it was frequently frustrating. I I I know I had uh, considerable issues with the uh, when it came uh, salary time because uh, people in the salary administration didn't always agree with my assessment of performance of some of my staff and. Uh, so I, I had to fight a lot of battles there. That uh, uh, I think that uh, well, I, can, I had some successes. Uh, I, one of them I have to tell you about is that uh, 
Um, during the uh, 60s, we were trying to, you know, we were out at the 100F area. The biology labs were out there. And we were, during the 60s, we were really trying to get a new laboratory uh, built in the 300 areas. And um, we had uh, everything going great for us. The, uh, the, uh, the design, everything. And all we had to wait for, all we needed then was the final authorization of money. And uh, uh, we had, it was around Christmas time, I don't remember exactly which year it was now, probably, you know, I can't remember, 68, 69, maybe, 70. Um, the uh, Kiwanis, local Kiwanis Club met at our house for a Christmas party. And Sam Bulpatest was there, you know the name Sam Bulpatest? <coughs> and uh, he, uh, he came up and said, Bill, how's that new laboratory coming? And I said, it wasn't. I said that uh, Nixon had, had sequestered the funds. You know the name sequester at <laughs> the time that, that worked? Uh, I don't think I'd heard it. I'd never heard it before that. I don't think I've heard it since then until recently. <laughs> but the money was sequestered by, by Nixon. Well, Sam said, well, you know, I'm going to be in Washington next week. I'll see what I can do. And uh, I think it was within two weeks that money was turned loose and we got a building. I, he made a believer out of me. Uh, and probably a lot of other people through the years. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so I felt that was a success. Mm -hmm. um, any, uh, uh, any other events that stand out to you as you look back at your years working at Hanford or incidents or strange occurrences or unique things that kind of happened? Well, um, uh, I know we had a few, uh, few threats of a uh, of union strike, and uh, since we were way out there, uh, we spent a few nights sleeping on the autopsy table because <laughs> we had to have somebody <laughs> there in case something, you know, something happened. And uh, uh, but the, uh, it wasn't until much later, though, that uh, we had any. Uh, Union members, the uh, animal caretakers. I think uh, not until after we moved in here did they uh, join the join the union. So most of the people working out there, um, scientists, uh, staff, scientific staff were not union, but the uh, the uh, craftsmen were. So we had we we dealt with them very. We had no problems with working with the, those people. We just had to obey the rules. I remember uh, one situation. Uh, we were. Uh, well, we talked about beagle dogs. I'll tell you how we, 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 uh, we got those. The first, uh, uh, we tried buying them. And when you buy anything in the government, you have to go out and uh, uh, bid. And uh, the, the lowest bid wins. Well, I remember um, one shipment of dogs came in, beagle dogs came in. And those dogs were about that high. They had the longest legs of any beagles I've ever seen. I can you imagine? I, I don't know what they were called, they were, so we shipped those back. But after a few episodes like that, we decided we had to, to raise our own dogs, so we developed a, our own colony. We had three, three strains of beagles. We got some from, from Davis, California. From Actually, Washington State had uh, a beagle colony over there. I forgot to mention that. And uh, we got another source from the Kimber, where else? But we had three strains, so we would can minimize in breeding. And we did have a geneticist uh, down in Portland who guided us in uh, our breeding program, so we wouldn't have any problems that way. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, what else I was going to mention? I can't remember now, what else? Um, yeah. Bill, can I yeah. ask you yeah. something? Yeah. So Gary Peterson always tells me to ask you about uh, the alligators out there. Oh, <laughs> uh, Gary was a neighbor, and of course I, I knew him when he worked out there too, because he's one of the guys I used to bug. Um, well, there was a, 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 an aquatic uh, physiologist out there who uh, had gotten some alligators. He was going to do some radiation studies with them, but before he could get started, he, uh, he left for another job. But while he was there, he did have, uh, he had the, uh, the alligators in a pond out behind the, the, the lab out there. It was not too far from the Columbia River. And I think one of them got, got loose, went into the Columbia River, and 
some fisherman found it, turned into the sports shop downtown, and it was displayed, and, you know, all kind of fuss and all that kind of stuff. And then um, um, when he left, you know, being a radiation biologist, I knew that, that not, nothing was known about the, the uh, sensitive alligators to radiation, you know. So I said, well, rather than have them destroyed, I'll take care, I'll take them. So I volunteered to take them, use the same facility, except I thought we ought to beef it up a little bit. So we um, we had, there was a, there's a, a little chain link fence around it, and um, we, uh, we we had uh, plywood put around also and wired to it. And then um, uh, for some reason, uh, those uh, alligators were able to, squeeze those boards apart and get loose. Well, there were, there were five of them that got, got loose. Um, three of them were radiated and two of them were controls. Um, well, I talked to, I think, Bobby Gary Peterson. <laughs> he was in public relations at the time. And uh, we agreed that, uh, that uh, we'll be smart this time. Rather than let somebody find them, we'll, uh, we'll report it to, to the media. So we did. But at the time, it was not very good because we were still working for General Electric at that time, so that puts that dates at then, of course. Um, the, uh, that night, uh, a, uh, General Electric, a vice president from General Electric arrived in town. He got up the next morning and uh, looked at the newspaper. There was big headlines, you know, alligators released to the Columbia River by General Electric scientists and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and he raised hell. He jumped on uh, W. Johnson, who was the plant manager. He jumped on Herb Parker, who worked for him, and he jumped on Harry Kornberg, who was my boss. So guess who? So I was ordered to put out a search team on the Columbia River until we found those alligators. And uh, we did. I had a crew out every day, and every week, every Friday, I had to turn in a report they went to W.E. Johnson on what we did to find the alligators. Well, at that time, the reactors were operating, so the water along the shore was still pretty warm from the cooling water. And so the alligators kind of hung along the shore. I think we caught all but, uh, but two. I think there was one uh, uh, controlled after, uh, and one radiated. I figured the radiated one had died. Uh, but and sure enough, uh, 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 in the process. I think another alligator crawled up by a fisherman, I can't remember now. But um, I think it was maybe by the end of the year, uh, we'd gone out, we never found any more alligators. And so there was still there was two missing. And uh, I finally got a note back from, from Parker saying I could uh, relax the hunt for the alligators. But you know, in, in subsequent years, I had calls from from people <laughs> I had a call from from some wild guy, life guy over on the other side of the river. That was pack. Gosh, that must have been in the, in the 80s. He wanted to know what I knew about alligators in the Columbia River. And I said nothing and then hung up. <laughs> and uh, then there was another, uh, I think more recent than that, I can't remember now. But uh, that's the story of the alligators. So, um, so it was, it, well, actually, it was interesting. It was also the alligators were really not very sensitive to radiation. But uh, we did find that um, the sensitivity varied with the temperature which they, uh, which the alligators were kept. If you put them in warmer water, the the effects would, were magnified, were increased. So the metabolism had a lot to do with the uh, the uh, effects occurring in these cold-blooded animals, mm -hmm. so, which did no, no surprise there. So. So what was the time period when this happened? The 60s? Well, it was the early 60s. It was before General Electric, so it must have been about 63 probably. Um, I wanted to ask you another question to you about these inhalation studies. You mentioned earlier that beagles were sort of ideal for this. What made them ideal? Was it their trainability? Uh, their size, their, their trainability, uh, because an awful lot of data had been collected by other laboratories on their physiology, their biochemistry, uh, diseases, everything. So we didn't have to do any of all that, all that background work. We had it already. Pathology, everything. You know, all we had to do was to go to the literature. So they were, uh, let's see if it's uh, made to order. Mm -hmm. Another another animal would have been more ideal in terms of respiratory tract. Believe it or not, a horse's respiratory tract is more like a 
man's than, than most of the other species. And we looked into getting miniature horses, <laughs> but uh, well, that didn't go very far. It was going to be too expensive. And I should say, you, know, you didn't mention anything about the swine, by the pigs we had out there. Um, uh, one of the early studies out there, uh, of course, I, was uh, Ray, studied Ray Wyatt, and I'm going to mention sheep first. Um, when Parker came here, uh, he knew that uh, there was going to be, going to be a problem with Ray Wyatt and being released, because he'd seen that happen on Oak Ridge. And so he had uh, the uh, experimental animal farm, which was led by Leo Bustad. We haven't mentioned Leo, but I should, because um, he was a graduate uh, veterinarian from Washington State University, and he was hired here in 48, I think, by Parker. He worked here until late, uh, in the mid 60s. Then he went down to Davis, California for several years, quite a few years. Then he became uh, dean of vet school to work at WSU. So, roundabout. And in fact, there's a building over there with his name on it, the vet school. Um, anyway, his uh, first job was to do studies on the uh, uptake of uh, and effects of uh, iodine, real iodine, and sheep. And the uh, sheep were because they were raising animals in the area, and uh, uh, there was obvious con con concern about what would happen if they got into the uh, into the sheep. And there were also cattle. They did a study with cattle. Uh, there were some very important studies because uh, there were claims later on from uh, people uh, and farmers, uh, sheep farmers in Utah, about uh, sheep being exposed to fold out and. Well, the, the, uh, the results from the lab here, from Leo's studies, really proved it. it was not radiation. They were eating a toxic weed that caused their deaths of their sheep. The farmers, I don't think they believe it yet, but uh, yeah, that, that's really w what happened. Um, they also did studies with, uh, with pigs um, because, as Leo said, you could take the GI tract of a pig and put it next to the GI tract of a man, and you'd never be able to distinguish the two. They looked exactly the same, so they did ingestion studies with uh, with uh, pigs. Now they they uh, developed a a miniature pig that would weigh when it was full size about 180 pounds. Standard man, standard man for most calculations is considered to be a 180 pound man. And then they also developed a uh, a miniature white pig for skin studies. So you could uh, white skin obviously better for for skin studies than a normal pig color <laughs> skin. Um, anyway, I need to mention those two studies because they were very important. Um, so those were, those were not inhalation? They were not inhalation. We did try an inhalation experiment with a, with a sheep, uh, with uh, iodine 131 at one time, and only once. Uh, sheep has no control over its uh, bodily functions. It, it was a mess. <laughs> Uh, so, so you were involved with uh, that program until about 1968. How long did the inhalation studies continue after you? They, they continued. Uh, in fact, as they developed into a very uh, profitable toxicology program, you know, inhalation toxicology program at Battelle, and I think it's just now recently closed down. Mm -hmm. So it uh, it was uh, it, it was it got off to a good start and had a, a, a long run. Mm -hmm. uh, and how about the uh, anim sort of animal studies in general? Um, how long did those continue? Was there ever any sort of opposition to, to that from the public at all? No, actually, uh, we, we, we fared very well. Um, uh, our veterinarians uh, were very uh, uh, astute about this kinds of situations. Our public relations people, Gary uh, Peterson and his people, um, they didn't... Uh, they would talk to us before they uh, responded to anything, so we we worked together to avoid uh, the problems. And we thought we would have when we moved our dogs into the 300 area because, you know, you could hear them bark on certain days. But uh, I, we never had a, had a period. None of these outfits uh, got to us. And they were over in Seattle. You know, they caused problems over there, the uh, PETA and those people. So. Um. Obviously, uh, security was a very important part of Hanford site. Um, what, I'm assuming you had special security clearance. Wonder if the uh, security impacted your work at all? No, uh, it really didn't. Uh, I think the, the first impact was when people came here for an interview. Uh, 
we were interviewed in the hotel, uh, and we never saw where we were working until we got got here. Have you ever been out to Hunter Death area? Not a long time ago. Long time ago. Okay. Well, it looks like a prison. No windows. <laughs> so the uh, first year, fir the first, uh, well, first uh, uh, thought when you go in there, you know, when you first day of work, you know, what am I getting into? But inside, it was really a good, good lab. So, but that was a uh, first, first impression. The security. Um, of course, we had to have, we had security clearance, and we had uh, there was no uh, we had to have every paper we published cleared by security people. Uh, Parker, I think he read everything that we published, uh, and, uh, and then the security people had, went over. Um, the only thing that uh, that they objected to was anything that uh, that um, referenced the amount of radioactive material that went into the river. Uh, concentrations of the radionuclides in the Columbia River, uh, any releases or anything like that, because they felt that the, that uh, that was a possible way of somebody finding out the how much plutonium was being produced. So, I don't know how, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure there were people uh, monitoring the temperature and things like that. So, uh, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned Herbert Parker. Um, are you involved with the Parker Foundation, or have been? Is that I, I, I founded it. Right. So yeah. you want to talk about that some? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, well, I, I knew Chris Herb from the day I arrived here, and uh, uh, he was a he was a tough manager, really tough. He didn't, he, he, nothing, he didn't give you any slack. <laughs> uh, things had to be just right, and uh, people who did stupid things uh, had a tough time with him. And... Uh, but uh, you know he was a uh, he insisted on the on uh, on quality uh, integrity he he really had high standards for everything we did out out, out there and um, uh, he he supported uh, our uh, uh, research uh, fully uh, as I said before I think he read everything we wrote so he knew what was going on. He also was a strong supporter of a symposium series that we put together back in about, it started about 1960. Uh, we had annual uh, uh, symposium on, um, in biology and included the environmental sciences too. He was a strong supporter of that. Uh, I, I worked with him, uh, he was my boss at one time. I worked with him very much in the, in the institutional review board, which was setting up a human subjects uh, kind of a review. And uh, so when he, uh, when he, when he died, uh, uh, I felt that, you know, he ought to be recognized in some way. And uh, I knew, of course, that he was interested in education. And so I talked to um, uh, a couple of people at the uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, controller at the time. Uh, well, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, Wallace Hale, I think, and uh, uh, decided to, to go in and, and, and uh, set it up as a uh, not-for-profit, not it wasn't associated with Battelle or anybody else, a not-for-profit uh, foundation. And we got it, uh, went to the state and got all the, all that approved and so forth. And then um, we, uh, the whole idea was to, um, to uh, have a, a, an annual, annual lecture s sponsored by the Parker Foundation to coincide with a symposia each year. Um, and so we did that for a number of years. And then when I retired, I felt that uh, that uh, there was a good chance that uh, that Battelle was not going to be around forever because um, their contract was limited. And Battelle was helping us so fund their lectures, so I, their money, their, their their support was 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 helpful, very important actually. And uh, uh, so I. Uh, uh, I talked to to um, Doug Olson, who was head of Mattel at the time, and and he agreed that there ought to be some way of of making sure it was um, maintained in perpetuum some way. So I talked to uh, to Jim McCochran, who was uh, the uh, was was he he wasn't called chancellor, I don't think, dean. was he? Hmm? Campus dean. Dean, yeah, and. Uh, I was amazed at his enthusiasm. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to sell something, but I, I didn't. And um, Ron Walters, at that time, was on 
on board. He he had replaced me, so uh, uh, we talked to uh, to Jim and uh, he explained that the rules haven't changed to, to, to this day as far as I know. He told us that we had to get twenty five thousand uh, dollars for before we could actually uh, have it uh, identify as a, a separate entity within the uh, foundation, and so that was our initial goal. So that's taken off and. Uh, a number of other people have joined the board, and some several of them died, of course, so through the years. And uh, I am, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, they will, will continue because I, not only for the fact that uh, I want to see Parker continue to be recognized for what he did here, but I think it's a uh, it has an opportunity to to provide provide some some uh, some real benefits to, to WSU and the